Welcome everyone to the first of many faculty recitals we have scheduled to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Philadelphia International Music Festival. We are being joined live stream by family and friends, parents and relatives of those students attending the Philadelphia International Music Festival and music lovers all over the world. So I'd like to say a special welcome to them. Welcome, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's concert features Kimberly Fisher, principal second violin of the Philadelphia Orchestra and artistic director of PIMF, Matt Vaughn, co-principal trombone of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and Mark Lifshitz on piano. So enjoy this wonderfully exciting event. Thank you again for joining us. And welcome to the first faculty recital of PIMF 2022. Um, Mark Lifshitz and I are thrilled to be joined by Matt Vaughn, our um, the associate mm -hmm. no, sorry, co principal uh, trombonist of the Philadelphia Orchestra. My name is Kimberly Fisher. I'm the principal second violinist of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and um, my colleague Mark and I play all the time, and so we're really happy to be here uh, to play for you tonight. Um, because of the live stream, we're going to make sure that we introduce the pieces, even though you guys have programs, the folks at home that are watching will then know what's going on as well. So we're going to start the program tonight with um, a Mozart sonata. Um, it's one of his shorter sonatas. It's K301 and uh, in G major. It's only two movements, which is unusual, but it's just a lovely gem of a piece. And uh, the first movement is Allegro con spirito, and the second is Allegro. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
Pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Matt Bonstrom, one of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and I thought I'd do a little theme for my part of this program in playing all of the instruments that I play in the orchestra. So you'll see trombone in the program. That's my normal instrument. This is a euphonium, which I play on occasion. And I'm going to start with a piece by William Grant Still. William Grant Still was one of the first successful black composers and um, wrote primarily uh, symphonies and operas and large-scale orchestral works. He did a handful of uh, instrumental pieces, and the, including this piece, this romance, which was originally for alto saxophone, and I'm just stealing it to play on the euphonium. Hope you enjoy.
Okay, I'm, I'm going from big to small. So next up in size is the bass trombone, which is basically the same as a tenor trombone, just a little bit larger, and it has two valves. And the piece I'm going to play is an arrangement uh, of Dona Nobis, sorry, <laughs> Dona Nobis Pacem, sorry, my, it didn't take Latin, uh, which means grant us peace. It's a very common melody. I think you'll recognize it. It's usually sung and around. David Feder has arranged this for bass trombone, uh, the melody plus several variations. Thank 
and trombone. I actually don't have a good reason. I just love the trombone. <laughs> and I always wanted Matt to come and play a recital and I was hoping that we could time it out to be on the same uh, concert as each other. And I love this idea he's doing where he's uh, changing, you know, using all of the different instruments that they use. I, I told him I was going to bring four violins, but I didn't do it. So we're on the same violin here. Um, the next piece I'm going to play is by Michael Doherty. He's an American composer. He lives in Michigan, teaches at the University of Michigan. And I found this piece because, as everyone who auditions for uh, conservatories in America knows, you got to find a piece that's written after 1960, <laughs> for, especially for Juilliard, but for other colleges as well. So I was always looking for a good piece that my students could learn that, you know, I didn't want them to have to go in where, to, to play something where the piano part or another part was so important that then their solo violin part didn't make sense and, and so, or that they'd have to, you know, sometimes take a pianist and travel far or try to put it together with a pianist on very short notice. So I've been, I was looking for a piece just like this one and then I found it. And really I just th I thought it was just a piece that I was going to teach my students over the years, but I've actually fallen in love with it. It's, um, Michael Doherty writes a lot of music that has um, influences of bluegrass and actually I think if I play it right you should hear some rock and roll in here a little bit too um, and uh, actually another famous piece that he's written was the tuba concerto which he wrote for our um, tubist uh, Carol Yanch who is probably the best tubist well I'm biased she's my friend but best tubist around nowadays and um, so I hope you enjoy this like kind of romp into crazy violin land Viva for violin by Michael Dawkins Thank you. 
brass now. It takes a lot of energy to do that. <laughs> I think I would be well done on an electric violin. Who here owns an electric violin? Oh, that's got to change. See, I really am out of breath. So I have an electric violin, but I don't know where it is. It's somewhere lost, lost in my house. <laughs> so next time I play it, maybe I'll find it. Whew. Okay, so the next thing we're going to play is the uh, um, Brahms Scherzo. And this is from a sonata. It's such an interesting story about the sonata because it was written by three different composers. Um, it was Robert Schumann, Johannes Brahms, and also Albert Dietrich, who has kind of gone into obscurity, but he was one of Schumann's uh, composition students. So they came up with this idea. It was Schumann's idea, but they all decided to write this sonata and give it as a dedication and a gift to the very, very successful and famous violinist, probably the most famous violinist at the time, Josef Joachim. And so they did so. In, um, they were in Dusseldorf, Germany at the time. It was 1853. And um, they, uh, Clara Schumann, Robert Schumann's wife, played the piano um, while Joachim played the violin part. And they didn't tell him who had written which movement. And they wanted him to have to guess. And he did so with ease. So apparently each of the composers really did compose in their style um, at the time. And he knew their work well. So. Um, all three of those composers wound up writing concertos that they dedicated to Joachim. So there was this continued connection uh, between these people over the course of time. I think this is an absolutely spectacular piece, Scherzo. It's the, the, the Scherzo movement of it. And um, yeah, I think you'll enjoy it a lot. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, I'm, I'm on the instrument I play the most, the tenor trombone. We have bass tenor, and that's a little alto, which I'll play next. And there is a soprano trombone, which I haven't tried. It's basically the same size as a trumpet, and I just don't have the face for that. <laughs> um, this is another romance. I have two rom romances on. I'm not sure how that happened. The first one was in E-flat major. This one is in C minor, so romance of a different type, maybe as it's gone sour. So I hope you enjoy the Weber romance.
talk a little bit, buy myself some, some time for my face to recover before I try the smallest instrument. Um, this uh, Leopold Mozart actually wrote, it says these two movements are from a serenade. I think it's about nine to 12 movements for uh, strings and various solo instruments. And from that piece, three movements were extracted, or were written specifically for trombone and probably alto trombone in mind. Um, of those, I'm doing one, the adagio, and I'm gonna actually start with that movement. And then the allegro movement, which you have printed first in your program, was originally written for trumpet. So I'm stealing one movement that was written for trumpet and uh, one that was originally written for trombone because I like them. That's why, why not? <laughs> That's what they used to do and they would play them on whatever instrument they wanted. Uh, so, historically accurate. So I hope you enjoy the Leopold. Oh, Leopold was obviously Wolfgang Amadeus's father, uh, which you heard earlier in the program. And Leopold was a very successful composer himself until he just stopped doing it in order to promote his son, which turned out okay, I think, for both of them. I hope you enjoy it.
next piece, La Gitana by Fritz Kreisler, is just a great um, short, one of his short flashy violin pieces uh, describing a young Spanish girl. And it's got all kinds of different flavor to it. Um, one of the things I love about this piece actually is the, in the slow, so it's sort of the third section of the piece. I actually relate incredibly deeply to this uh, section. I, I think that it has a, it played a role in my life as a person and as a musician that nothing else will ever take place there. Um, I remember when I was about 11 years old, I experienced for the first time seeing true poverty and um, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And soon after that, I was learning this piece. And, and in, in specifically what the poverty was, is I saw um, a woman who was begging. Uh, we were actually in Northern Africa. That's uh, important in some ways because it had that flair of sort of a Spanish moment too. Um, and this woman was begging, but she wasn't begging for herself. She had with her a child um, who had some physical disabilities that were obvious. And um, I had never seen anything like this in my life. The look in her eyes, she made eye contact with me, a child, and um, the look in her eyes was this, this desperation, hoping that another child would even be able to help her uh, to, to take care of her, her own son. And it just, it just changed me, and, and not for the worse, but it just it gave me a whole new world, and um, you know, I, I think of her so often when playing music. So this, this one section, then it, it became a, sort of an anthem for that for me, and so every time I play this, I sort of dedicate it to her, I dedicate it to you know, people who are struggling, and, and uh, I hope you'll feel it as deeply as I, I am trying to express it to you. And um, that you'll, as you're on your own paths, that you'll look for those moments that could come and go very quickly without you noticing, but you'll look for them and then, you know, inject, inject them into the music, into the art that you make, because it can make a difference to people who get a chance to hear it and who you can then tell that story to. So, hope you enjoy this piece. Thank you. 
last actual official piece for tonight is Oblivion by uh, Astor Piazzolla, the Argentinian composer, who uh, sort of wrote down how tango goes for the first time, because before that it sort of been uh, transferred from generation to generation by, you know, word of mouth and by ear, essentially. And he sort of made that happen, which I'm so glad about, because it's such a great treat to have his music in our classical, so-called classical uh, repertoire. So this is actually an arrangement for piano trio, which would normally be piano, violin, and cello, uh, but it works really well with trombone. And when we were rehearsing, I said to Matt, this is like the most fun I've ever had playing anything, because it's just so fun to play with a trombone, <laughs> and especially with Matt on trombone. So Oblivion <laughs> by Piazzolla. sounds so awesome. Um, so now, as we've been doing this year um, to end our evening activities, and then Jack played it for us, uh, the, the meeting and so on, we're highlighting um, Florence Price's adoration. So uh, we're going to make it play it so many times that you know it by memory. And um, it's just, I don't know, to, you know, Juneteenth is happening. I think it's important that Florence Price was a black woman composer. Uh, that's not why we're playing her piece today. It's not because it's Juneteenth. It's because it's great music, and it's finally getting a voice, and that makes me feel so, uh, it's so rewarding to have that happen, to be part of that. 
Um, the Philadelphia Orchestra won a Grammy for Florence Price's symphonies, and uh, we're very, very proud of that, and proud that we, we her music was on the, our radar um, even before it, her, it before it became sort of a social statement. She's a great composer in her own right. So um, I just want, about Juneteenth, I just think we have to make sure that we, we recognize this wonderful, um, that it's a federal holiday, but that's not enough, and we have to, as a society, we have to make sure that that's the minimum of what we do to recognize why we should have a celebration or a, a recognition such as Juneteenth. So tonight, this is um, dedicated to Florence Price, which sounds kind of... Uh, funny to say, but I actually really, really want it to be in her honor, not just as a piece, but also as a, as a gesture towards what she accomplished against all odds. Adoration, my Florence Price. <laughs> 